Hi everyone, welcome to my channel. My name is Jason. Today we're going to take a look at this engine I've bought out of a recent auction sale. Now, it's a Chevy 350. It's a TBI engine. The block is coated, or stamped. Sorry about the sun there, everyone. It's stamped. The last three numbers are 727. So we know it's an 86 and up. One piece rear seal. And right there, if you see it, I'm trying to zoom in, it says 5.7. So we know it's a 350. So that's about what we know so far about this engine. I put it on the stand the other night, and I, I need to tear it down and get it ready. We have a couple different options we can do here. I kind of need a stock TBI 350. As well, I wouldn't mind doing a Vortec headed hydraulic roller 350 as well. I have a project vehicle for that. But before we get started, let's take a quick inspection and see what we can see on this engine here right now. So what we're seeing here right now is we have a relatively complete engine. The right hand exhaust manifold is missing. It came with the motor, it just wasn't on. But what did not come is all the front accessories. So as you see it is how I got it. It doesn't even have a pulley on the power steering pump, which is kind of nice because it makes removal a little bit easier. It had no antifreeze in it, so there was no fear there. But it does have oil, and oddly enough, it has clean oil in it. So that's a good thing. Never bad. It doesn't look like it's ever been apart. But I do see a Felpro valve cover gasket as well. And we'll inspect this as we go along to see what we can see. Maybe it has been apart, maybe it hasn't. Little things like the, the little tabs and tangs for the exhaust manifolds are still in place. You would have to bend these out of the way in order to get your socket on there. Um, it has spark plug holders still, which is nice. Most people rip them off and use, you know, pull ties and stuff. Um, I did drain this side of the block. One side was drained of antifreeze. One side wasn't. This is the side that wasn't. And that's the fitting that comes out of it. So usually when you see this, it's pretty, you're pretty sure this is a stock engine. Most of the rebuilders use an Allen head and they put it in there. They're a little bit tougher to get out, but these are still the original ones, and I like working with these a little bit better. <clears throat> we need to drain the oil still. But before that, let's just take a look at a couple of the things we need here before we get going. So these are just some of the tools that I laid out. Basic sockets. Um, we're going to need a 10, a 13, and a 14 mil on the front, and some of the accessories on these engines actually had metric bolts. But for the rest of it, it's your common 3 8 7 16 half inch, 9 16 5 8 we have a couple ratchets there, a set of pliers and a crescent wrench, a couple wrenches, and of course your screwdriver, and for when you're pulling your heads and intake, pry bar. And for you that are visually impaired, we also have glasses. On top of that, for specialty tools, biggest thing we're probably going to need is our harmonic balancer puller. Alright. So, when we were inspecting this engine real quick to take a look at it, one of the big things for me is, it turns over. The ears on the block are still there. Even the starter side, that's always a biggie. Nothing really looked damaged. It all looked relatively complete and all there. So, as far as a basic inspection goes, and like I say, with relatively clean oil, it looks like a good candidate for a rebuild. Or it could even be a re-ring, depending on the shape it's in. But because I don't really want a low compression engine, it probably won't be that. Um, one of the things to keep in mind when you're buying an engine like this, you always kind of want to do an inspection to find out what you have. One thing you don't want to run into is, like I say, a broken block, a cracked block. Um, you know, you don't want to buy these and just put them in either. You want to do a pretty good check. I mean, some of the things that happen, if these engines are full of bearing material, say, they've had a spun bearing or they've had problems along the way, and say you have an oil cooler on your vehicle. Now your lines, your cooler and stuff are going to get, well, they're going to get infected with the same material. So when you do an engine swap or you do a change, or if you, if you put a new engine in place of an engine that had a bad bearing, you need to address those oil lines. You need to address that cooler issue. All that stuff stays in there and it's just going to go through the new engine or the replacement engine once you change it. So these are just some of the things to bear in mind when you're doing this. You just want to try and cover every angle and make sure that you don't 
find yourself in a bad situation a few hundred dollars in. So, if you just give me a minute here, we'll get started and we'll get this thing torn apart. Alright everyone, let's get started. Um, this is my first video. I've never done anything like this before, so just bear with me. I'm probably going to ramble on a little bit, but we'll get this thing apart and we'll find out what we have and figure out what the situation, the best situation is to move forward. We'll try and document some things along the way. I'll try and answer any questions I think would come up along the way as well. If there are problems that people may encounter while they're doing this. One of the interesting things here is, I see there's no base gasket for the throttle body, but there's some form of a rubbery foam between that and the air cleaner. It's kind of interesting. Half inch. So for the time being, we'll just set the throttle body aside. An interesting note, it had no throttle body gasket in it, so somebody's had this off. Since the end. All right, let's take that off. We'll take the vacuum line off for the uh, power brakes. Sorry, I just had to fix my camera there. Coming back to this line here for our power brakes. I don't really need to use a crest wrench, but I'm going to, so I have it out. So, this was an 11 16th, just so you know. Keep that in mind when you're doing this stuff. Like I say, some is metric, some it isn't. So let's get rid of this and the bracket it's attached to. The bracket bolts at the back of the cylinder head are either going to be 14 or 9 sixteenths. Okay, let's remove that. One of the things you're going to want to do have a container for all of your bolts and all the things you want to keep. There's all kinds of different ways you can do this. You can use boxes, you can use plastic. But just use whatever is easiest for you. I'm just going to use a black box here. Collect all the stuff inside of there. I can deal with it when I go to clean it at the end. So, drain the oil over here real quick. It comes out as oil and not water, so that's a that's a good sign as well. Leave that aside. The other thing you always want to have is some rags around. You want to keep yourself as clean as possible. And your work area as clean as possible. You don't want to trip over things or have any issues. So we'll continue with taking off some accessories. So these are a stud and a bolt on the front of these. And unfortunately, we have one turning here, so let's let me grab a wrench. Up here, metric. You can use a half inch, but all right. 
you move this out of the way. For some people, it might be a good idea to keep their bolts in order and the way they took them out. Um, I can usually remember what I've done. I've done this several times in the past, so that way I'm lucky. So it's not usually a big deal. But some people might not know, so you can keep your accessory bolts and your intake bolts and stuff like that in a particular order to help you with reassembly again. Let's get that top knocked over. so we can start seeing a little more. These bolts are also, we have a couple in the back. We have a couple down here. And we, we'll take that bracket off. All right, so I know I went a little fast for you guys there, but there's two at the bottom here, the bottom of the block. There's these two, one side here, one side there. For here and obviously the third uh, entrance of the cylinder head there. So let's just get that out of the way. Remove the valve cover. There's nothing that looks too alarming. I don't see any flakes. No, actually I do. Hmm. This engine didn't get very regular oil changes, we know that for sure. Okay, let's get some of this part. studs with nuts on them. You always want to remember where your studs are. They're usually there for a reason, something bolting to them, as well as our coil bracket here. It'll be a half inch. Might as well get these out of the way now. We'll get the studs. The one stud on the driver's side rear is at the very back. It assists with the throttle kick down bracket. Both. Again, these are 916s. And for the front lift hook, both of these are on studs. Another uh, stud on the alternator, pardon me, on the thermostat that was in here. 
and it probably goes in the back of the alternator and the air conditioning. So remember that stud is there. Oh. No stud. Just a bolt. Another bolt. Apparently, somebody's taking on an intake bolt already. Stud. And a bolt. Somebody has bent that, so. Just bend it over the weight. So now we just want to lift the intake off and ordinarily if you were doing this and you were working on a vehicle or repairing a vehicle, you want to be very careful. You don't want to get any dirt or dust in here, but we're already tearing this engine apart. We're not as concerned about this right now. So a couple ways of doing this. I use a bar. You can use a bracket as a fulcrum point. Because you really don't want to start jamming things in there, getting carried away. You don't need to use a hammer. I see people on YouTube using hammers for stuff like this. It's not that hard. Just take your time. If there's a little bit of area everywhere. You can just gently pry on all corners if you have to. But generally, these come off pretty easily. So, like that. So, I'm glad we tore it apart. I can see some rust there in one cylinder, and apparently, the paper towel. So we'll deal with that. Get rid of these gaskets. This will throw this stuff in the garbage. Alright, let's deal with a couple small things. Let's deal with all these little Spark holders. Get the little brackets off. And then my glasses, but this should be three eighths. Also, your dipstick is attached on this side as well, right? So try not to break it. Just cringe while you're doing this. There we go. Came up, no issues. That's what we like to see. Those bolts away. Take these off again, freeze. A couple other things. We can take a look at the spark plugs real quick here. Let's see what's going on inside this engine. Let's see if one's been closed off. Dark, a little bit of rust. Hmm. They don't look real nice, do they? A little dark. Some deposits. Feel additive. Hmm. Okay. So far, nothing's closed up. Again, a good sign. If you have a spark plug that's closed up, I've seen that in auction vehicles where people have actually closed them up to hide a knock. So, what you're buying is an engine or a vehicle with an engine that seems to have a slight miss. When in all reality, it has a spun bearing. So, don't know why I do this. I still use a crest wrench. I have for about 25 years for these things, and I'll probably continue to do it. This is the oil pressure sender. Take a look inside, see if it's leaking. It's not. Will we reuse it? Probably not. 
One of the things with oil pressure senders and temperature senders, they're not that expensive. And when you have a new engine, you probably don't want to take a chance on an old sender that may or may not work, right? So that's obviously a decision you'll have to make along the way. I typically buy new ones, but that's just me. Let's get rid of this bracket on the back. 916s. And something else this engine has. The much needed ground wire. Back in the day, when I worked at GM, if you took one of these wires off the back of the engine, say you were servicing it or something went wrong, you, know, you were doing a major repair, if you didn't hook this back up again, it was usually this side on the driver's side, you'd get what you used to call phantom wipers. Your wipers would work, then they wouldn't. Then they would work again when you didn't want them to. Then they wouldn't. And along the way, we really learned how grounding stuff is very critical on fuel injected vehicles. So, that was kind of neat to see. One of the other things we see here, this engine's been apart before, so that's Felpro intake gaskets. So, we really don't know what we have here right now. Let's take our valve gear off. And we'll, uh, follow that up with removing the cylinder heads. This tool is relatively new still. A little tight to get these things on. Kind of funny. I'll try and fast forward this in the video. Now, contrary to what most people will tell you, you don't always need to throw these rock arms away. You can always see their indent at the bottom. They always have a wear mark inside on the bottom of them. Some are worse than others. Some of the problem I find is the aftermarket stuff we buy today is really worse than this. So, I'm not saying that you should reuse them for a general repair or cam swap or whatever you can. But Try and find out where you're getting your, your items when you're buying them new, like your rock arms and stuff. A lot of them just come from one place and they're all reboxed by different manufacturers. So you can pay five bucks one place or eight bucks another place and you're still getting the same item. So that's something you want to be careful about. So I like to let people know that. I recently bought a set of lifters for a small box Chevy. I bought the sealed power, I think they were. 569 a piece, and I bought the engine tech, which were, I want to say, 289 a piece. And I got them on the same order, and they were the same lift here. Like, break down to everything. So, it's a little disappointing to see that the brands that we've stuck with for many years are the things that we think we know are no longer that way. Delphi used to stop making lifters, and they were the ones that made the small block Chevy lifters. They used to have the uh, the piece put onto the bottom. There's a hardened piece put onto the bottom of the lifter. So you always had a ring around the lifter that looked like it was a two-piece lifter. And uh, that's going to be... So now we're, we're all dealing with one-piece, one-body lifters. So it's going to be a bit of a problem. None of these ones want to come out, by the way. So I was going to show you, but it's not working out. Take this head off. And use the other uh, impact for this.
So you want to watch the corners when you're doing these. The corners will build up with a whole bunch of gunk. And when you go to put your socket on the bolt, it won't fit really well. So, just to show you, when you're doing the corner one, if you just run your screwdriver around the corner, just so you can get the socket on the bolt, here's one, here's just the amount of stuff that came off of there. There's a lot of dirt in there. So sometimes you don't get it on there right, right away, or you might, you won't strip the bolt because it'll slip off it right away, but again, keep that in mind when you're doing this. You want to be going back and trying to dig that out after. So the center bolt, I usually just screw in a couple threads. So like I mentioned, I screwed the center bolt in a couple threads. Part of the reason why is some people will pry on a cylinder head and it'll, uh, it'll finally come off. In this case, we have oil underneath us. And you know, you should take the pan out on the, on the way by and create a huge mess. The other reason, not that they ever come off that easy, but if they did, and you didn't have a pin, like I don't, in your edges stand, that could be a bit of a problem too. So you just want to watch that stuff. Pry the head off. Once you have it moving, just take the bolt out by finger. You can carry on removing your cylinder head. This is terrible. Again, just out of the corner of that bolt. Just terrible. Well, it's the stuff in this engine. Very crusty in here. For doesn't look like it's had a very good uh, service life. Get these up. So these are all five eighths, by the way. Again, we left the center bolt in there with a couple threads still. So we just want to be safe. We don't want to have anything come crashing down on us. It's pretty easy. So I watch a lot of people hammering or prying. I just go to the back bar, little ridge here, that's it, it's loose, do the air side here real quick, that's her, a lot of people are jamming stuff inside the port, it's like, it's easy when you're on an engine stand, if you're in a vehicle, it's a little bit more difficult, but there's always things you can do, you have a small area, under here, you can put a bolt here and use this. Just be careful. Don't cause yourself any grief. It's not that big of a deal. But yeah, the whole jamming bars inside of here and stuff, you don't want to hurt anything either, right? You still have to use this stuff. Well, that's uh. There's a lot of junk in this motor. We'll show you that here in a second, what just happened here. Let's get both of these off. All right. Well, we have a dish piston engine. Nothing too spectacular. 
take a look at some of the parts we've just seen here up to this point. So we've just assembled the whole engine for the most part, top end wise. And uh, let's take a look and see what we have here. So 194 valve head, should be a 193. We'll check the casting numbers. And then we have this cylinder head. So it had a bunch of moisture again inside of it. So that's going to be a bit of a problem. And we're going to have to capitalize on our machine shop to fix that up for us. A whole bunch of dirt that came out of it. Yada, yada, yada. So we'll continue on with the disassembly. Here's what we have. Some dirty cylinders. Dish pistons. Surprisingly, very little ridge. Hmm. Surprisingly good shape. Alright, let's continue on. So we're back. I'm just sweeping up a little bit of the mess here for removing the cylinder heads. I like to keep my work area as clean as possible. That's just me. Just a habit I've developed over the years. It's not a... It's not really required on a disassembly, but... Just nice to keep your area clean. It is my main work area overall, so I'll just sweep this into the garbage can. All right, let's get that water pump off. Get the harmonic balancer off. Holy. Nine sixteenths, four of them. These bolts can sometimes be quite tight. Remove the extension off your tool. We'll give it a little more power to get the job done. Sixteenth. Oh, maybe not. I'm gonna see. Let's turn about that. All right. Start by putting this tool together. You want to thread the puller on a little ways. Depending on what you're going to use at the end of the crank. Might just use this. There's a lot of different options. This is just the one I use. The whole idea of using this three bolt puller, just get all your stuff in evenly. That's all. And then we'll uh, we'll buzz it out after. One of the things is you want to use this style of puller for any rubber or less longer balancer. Um, again, I was on YouTube. 
And uh, I've seen guys use three jaw pullers before. And uh, it doesn't work real well. They'll usually pull. They're separated by a elastometer here, some rubber. And it dampens everything, and that's the whole idea of it. So you have a smooth engine, and then that's what they call the harmonic balancer. It actually has a purpose in the job. So you don't want to damage it, nor do you want to pull pull against the uh, rubber part, or the outside part between that and the rubber part. So we'll just take that up there. We have, actually we don't have, I just looked again. There we go, looks even. Make sure that's even. Make sure you have sufficient threads in there and you'll be just fine. Three-quarter? You betcha. So, we're slowly just going to be going forward, so we're going to be screwing this into the crankshaft. We're not going into the crankshaft because it's blocked by the fitting there. But as we screw in, the balancer should come off. There we go. Problem solved. Balancer's off. A lot of people struggle with this. You can rent the tool from any of your local parts stores, I believe, in any area you're in, for the most part. And they're not that hard. Just take your time, make sure the tool's even on there. Don't panic. Doing it with a wrench is a little tougher. If you can't hold it, it will be a little tough. As you notice, we were having an issue here with, uh, with the engine turning over slightly. So. I just like to put all this stuff away. Now we can take a look to see what's behind the timing cover. Maybe somebody's put a cam in here in the past. Maybe not. So let's do that. Again, have a rag on at all times. Nice to stay clean. Seven, six inch or three eighths? Three. Dirty. Fix them that. We're gonna rush our way in there. <laughs> yeah, so far so good. One of the problems with pulling the cover off is we're gonna have to remove them a little bit. So there's no use trying to pry the cover off with the oil pan on. You can get it off. Just gonna end up bending a bunch of stuff. There's no real point. So let's continue with the disassembly here. Let's get rid of these motor rounds. Actually. Turned the heater on in this place earlier, and it must be about 38 degrees in here.
Other than that, it's a pretty nice day overall. We're in sunny Saskatchewan, Canada. Bunch of snow on the ground. I think it's minus six today. All right, so moving on. We're gonna do these oil pan bolts right away. There's two different sizes. Oops. Oh, you grab one. We're gonna need a half inch or 13 mil for the back and the front. There are, the back one's here on the stud. No shoulder on the hole. Same as the front. The front will be. Now, most people would roll their engine over to do this, which is probably a smart idea if you don't want to be bending over doing it. However, the engine has been sitting for so long now, like this, that there should be little to no oil on the backs of the pistons or inside the hull of the pistons. So when we drop a pan. Essentially, it should almost be semi-drain, right? The rest of the residual will be in the pan. So, then we can roll it over and we can knock the pistons out and remove the camshaft and uh, basically get it down to a bare block. So, we'll continue that in a couple minutes here and I'll be right back. Hey everyone, we're back. So my heater's going in the background, so I thought I'd take this time to do a quick recap. So what we have is we're tearing apart this 350. So when I was going behind the camera, there's our valve covers, our bracket, our intake, and our water pump. So while we were gone, I got rid of the oil drain plug. I swept up again. The other cylinder head is still in the same spot. And this, this is what we've done so far. Here's our parts. Here's that cylinder head that had a bunch of corrosion in it. We said these are 193s. They are 193s, which is pretty much standard on every TBI engine. Now, something that was odd about this engine is I bought it because I wanted a hydraulic roller block, but as you can see, it's not even a, not even a roller block. It's just a standard block. You would have the raised three bosses here and the spider and the machine lifter um pad areas so it's not that so it will just be a regular tbi or just a regular build but it is in surprisingly decent shape so far from what i can see so i'm going to keep going into it see what i can see there's some scratches in this cylinder but we'll take a look see what all we have um in case anybody's wondering what all i'm using just Milwaukee power tools. It's the same stuff, guys, that we had when we started the video. Nothing's really any different. We have the top end tore apart. Um, everything's pretty clean. We're pretty organized. We have things going. So we'll continue on here. I'll just mount this back where it belongs and uh, we'll start over. Thanks. Hey, we're just back here real quick. I just want to show everybody a couple more things here. This block actually says 350 on the passenger side behind the non-drilled fuel pump area. And the other thing I want to point out is everybody always forgets and thinks they're missing a bolt. The oil pan stud is directly under the bottom motor mount bolt hole. That stud is there so you can install your cooling line holder. And then there will obviously be another nut. So if you're wondering why you're missing a bolt and why you have an extra stud, that is exactly where you want that to be. So let's just take out this last bolt. I've taken these bolts out. We go up here. And like I said to you earlier, the ends are half inch or 13 mil. The insides, they were 3 eighths. 
the nut for the stud is 7 16 the stud itself will be 3 8 and one more okay along with this will come the the oil pan that holds it as well so be careful don't draw anything let's drop this down so we'll put this here a little bit of goo in the bottom there put our birds away so now we can start pulling the short block apart I wanted to know if it's a two or four bolt mean. I can see it's a two bolt mean. And, uh, yeah, we'll get moving. All right, guys, we're back. We're going to finish tearing apart the short block of this 350 Chevy. So let's take a quick look here. We can see it's a two bolt mean, just two bolts on each mean. Um, we're going to take off the oil pump. So 5 8 bolt here. Keep that bolt. Make sure you keep it for the oil pump. For the next one you're putting back on. We'll remove the rear seal. So we have a we have a stud here. We have a bolt here. And we have two more bolts um, below. We probably can't see. It's probably the engine stand. It's a blockness there. Something else I can see. We don't have any numbers on the, any of the rods. So if you were planning on reusing this engine, like if you were going to rearrange it or something, you'd want to make sure you number it correctly. So this would be number two, passenger side two, four, six, eight, driver side one, three, five, seven. So we'd have to put a two here and a two here. We would use a stamp to do that. So we'll get our stamps out. And we'll start numbering and dis dismantling the rest of the engine from this point. All right. All right, let's get to work. Keep this bolt aside. You want to reuse that in the same location it came from. Oil pump off. You'll see it's attached by a plastic cover. This shaft is separate. And we'll go through this later when we do the assembly of the engine. We're actually going to be assembling an engine right after we're done taking this one apart. So I have a brand new um, fully machined TBI 350 here that needs assembly. So we'll go through the assembly after that. But generally, that's what holds these together is the plastic collar. So you'll see that they fit in here. It's just a slot it fits into. And then the collar holds the two into place. But again, we'll get into that later. All right. Move that timing cover real quick. Let's see what we got back there. Okay, timing cover. A really loose, wore out uh, factory single roller timing chain. And these engines use a one piece oil pan gasket. So we'll remove that. Get rid of that. Half inch bolts for the cam gear. Simply a location of the three bolts and a dell. Get rid of the timing chain. 
we won't be reusing that. And I'm going to put this back on because I actually used the cam gear to remove the camshafts. They, they sell a handle that you can bolt up that you can actually grip onto and pull out. Some guys just use three long bolts. I just use the cam gear. I find that to be the easiest way for me. Again, you'll find the way for you the more you do this stuff. All right, this bag's stud, 7 16 We'll get this off here. Some of these bolts I'll keep aside because I'll clean them separately with separate items. I wish I would have done this before. I picked up the engine on the stand. Sorry about that. Our heater's coming on in the background. Shouldn't be on too long. I just had the door open for a few minutes. It's pretty warm in here. It's a, it's a small garage. It's only about 540 square feet, and the ceiling's quite low. It's only about just under eight feet tall. So I have a really good heater, and it gets warm really quickly. The bolt on the passenger side, on the, on the this is the driver's side, you know, which reverse on the camera has a stud. The bolt for this, the lower bolt, closest to the oil pan for this one piece seal, is long on the right side, on that one. We'll take a look at the other two here. Short one. And then the final one, the upper driver's side, if we have the engine flipped over. Is also short. They're both short. So it's just the one long one. So if you get your bolts all mixed up, if that makes sense and helps you out, that's great. You don't have to use this big of a pry bar, it's just that's what I have out. And there we have it. Your one piece rear seal. For your late model later model Chevy 350. Alright. Clean that later. Okay, let's put these pistons out. So maybe we should just number these right now. So, make sure you keep these in order. Like I say, passenger side bank, we flip it over, 2468. So we'll do number two. There we go. The best thing I can recommend as well, when you work on this step, is a couple of the proper tools are nice to have. Something as simple as just having this piece for the, to turn the engine over with. A lot of guys will use a, like a crescent wrench, which is fine. Maybe avoid using pipe wrenches because it really nicks up the front of the crankshaft and it'll make it a little bit harder when you're changing timing gears. It makes it a little bit hard to come off, a little bit hard to come to go back on, so maybe just watch for that. Alright, let's do number four next. So I got it to a point where it's easy for me to see it.
if you want to see what that looks like real quick, we'll just take a quick peek. Actually, let me change this around. Actually, I'll stop. Okay, sorry, we just came back. I just had to fix my camera. So there we go. There's the numbers there. So we had no numbers before. That was number four. We can look. We numbered number two. I'm just going to number the, the rest of these, and then we'll uh, continue on after that. All right, we're back here again. So we've numbered all of our rods. We can see that we all, they're all numbered now. So our rods are all numbered. We know where they're going to be or where they came from and where they're going. As well, when you look at the main cap, now they're not always numbered. So you want to make sure when you're doing your engine, mains are especially important. You can get the uh, front four mixed up here. So this one's number one. You can see the number one. Sorry, I'll let it focus. And an arrow. And that arrow points toward the front. You always want the arrow going to the front. And again, number two. Arrow to the front. Number three. Arrow to the front, number four. So we know we have one, two, three, four on our main caps. Number five is pretty obvious. It's the only one that's different. So always make sure that your main caps are numbered before you take them off. Now you can use a number punch like I did. Um, you can engrave it. Some people will actually use a punch and they'll put a dot here and two dots on that one and three dots on that one. There's all kinds of different ways you can do it, but just make sure you do it and it's numbered. That way you don't have any problems later. And uh, you can continue on with your assembly. So we'll continue to disassemble this. And uh, we'll get this apart and we'll get ready for the new engine that's gonna be going on the stand and being assembled. All right, let's get this apart. Put our uh, number stamps back. So, you can start wherever you want. We know we have a number. So, I'll just, just start right here. We'll do five and six. These are nine sixteenths, the rod bolt nuts. Put them on by a couple more threads. If they come off. In case you have to use a hammer to tap them. Alright. So it'd be nice if you could just push my finger and do it. Just like that. So sometimes if you have an aftermarket like an ARP rod bolt, that probably isn't going to happen. They're going to locate a lot tougher, especially if you, know, if you have a good rod resizer and a good rod bolt, it will locate. And it will be hard to move sometimes. So keep that in mind. So we'll pull that out. We see the bearing is actually you can't see that. Maybe I will move this around a little bit. All right, a bit wrangle there. So we just removed number six. And we have a bearing that's stuck. So let's get that bearing off the crankshaft. There we go. So this is the bearing off the, it'll be off the cap. This bearing is not good. It's got a lot of material through it. Has some dirt, has some burning on it as well. Oops. The crank is very, very scratched. This is just on the verge of spinning the bearing. Actually, if it hadn't spun, I'd be surprised. We can see it still has the tab here. I don't know if you can see that, the tab right, right here. But it's, uh, I can barely see it actually. This thing's in tough shape. This motor wouldn't have went very much further. Anything else in this bearing that we can see? Not really. So, again, 
very poor shape. So let's get this. Hurt. The bearing doesn't even fit in the rod anymore. So it's uh there's no crush left. When you tear these out, like I say, make sure you're on the top. You want to be able to push the, the piston and the rod away from the crankshaft. You don't want to damage anything if you don't have to. doesn't matter if it's damaged, but like I say, if you're doing a freshen or a re-ring, it could matter, right? Now, that might not be the best way to do things. So if you had a ridge your engine, do what we just did there, it could you could find yourself tapping on the piston pretty hard and marking it up. That might bother some people, it might not, but there's really no point doing that, so do your best not to do that. This is a factory GM bearing. So these are the factory bearings. This thing's in tough shape from the bottom. Sorry, I just noticed that my uh, camera's a little high. So, just show this. I'll adjust the camera here in a second. Put your stuff back together in the same order. A little bit easier to keep tabs on everything. Let's take off number five. I think I'll show you guys how bad this is. This crank isn't gonna take a polish. It's gonna need a regrind. So I hope you guys can see that well. It's in pretty tough shape, but that's why we do this. That's why we check on this stuff so we can correct it. Let's get that over there. So. Again, top. One of the things about using a skinny bar like this is you can be on the other side of the rod. Now, when we push this down, the rod's gonna fall against the sleeve. And some guys will beat them down and the end of the rod bolt will catch on the end of the sleeve. It generally won't do any damage. But again, I just like to hold the rod in place and push everything up straight out. Just like that. No issues. I suspect the rest of the engine is going to look close to the same. Yep, yeah, straight pull. Push.
to the load. Very tight on the rod. Hmm. One of the reasons we could have seen that intake gasket replaced is that there could have been a could have been leaking antifreeze into the engine at some point in its life. When you get antifreeze in there, it's not real uh it's not really a good thing. A lot of the times you can see rods tighten up, like we're seeing here. That's the way a bearing should look after a few years, albeit not perfect, stays in the rod cap. Just captured a little bit of particles in there and embedded them in there, but generally not too bad for an engine that's, well, 35 years old. 34 years old, somewhere in there, to the best of our knowledge. Very sick in there. Remove a bearing from the cap. Sometimes it's just as easy as, like I say, I don't have this camera in a great spot here. I just push them over to the side and take them off. You can push them opposite of the tab. They're not hard to get out. You'll figure it out. All right, two more left. Then we'll take up the crankshaft. Then we'll remove the cam.
don't have to pry on them. You don't have to use a hammer. You don't have to give them a big whack. They are in there with a bit of an interference fit. That's how they locate. But just give them a gentle tap on the upswing. That's all. The back one might be a little different. It can be a little tighter. the thrust bearing so each side of this will hold so the crankshaft has movement and it's limited here and here and here and here and we'll discuss that when we're assembling the next engine there's acceptable clearance for that and it's very important that you meet that clearance the minimum clearance and in a performance application it could be a little bit different as well all right, let's lift this crankshaft over here. Sometimes the bearings will come, sometimes they won't. All right. We can pop the bearing shells over there. We no longer need those. We won't be reusing them. Like I said, you can push them out. The tab is on my side. You can grab them by the side, pull them. Either way, with the back one, again, people get frustrated. Not a big deal. That's it, just a little pressure tug. That one comes. That one, uh, it's in a little bit tighter than the other ones. I guess all we really need to do now is remove the camshaft. The lifters didn't want to come out of here. Let's push those out of the way. Like none of them want to come out. So we'll knock them out from the top once the cam's removed. Don't use beating up your cam bearings while you're doing this either. Again, if this was a fresh and in a rearing and you didn't want to redo this step, we wouldn't. We want to be very careful. We don't want to put a bunch of dents or scratches into them. So taking a look at this, let's take a look and see what we can see. Actually, this camshaft, it's going away, but there's no actual rounded off load to show you. Most of the time, when you have a, when you're looking at camshafts, there's always numbers on the back. Typically, even stock ones have numbers. This one has no numbers. Could be on the front. Nope. Alright. Well, that is basically the disassembly. Like I stated, we are going to be building a brand new engine here. 
So if you'd like to tune back in and uh, watch that, you're, uh, I would appreciate that actually. Let me show you a couple more things here real quick. Before we go, we'll just take a quick look inside here. Sorry about the angle, you guys. I'm trying to do the best I can see. As you can see, even after I hit him with the screwdriver, all the lifters decided they wanted to stay in there. So we'll just knock those out from the top. See them in here? This is pretty dirty and grimy inside. And they all stayed in. And here's the crankshaft here. So, trying to get an angle so you can see how scratched up it really is. It's in pretty tough shape. So, I hope this helps some people who were uh, going to disassemble their engine or take on a project during this time in COVID. Um, if there's anything else you guys would like to see, let me know. We have a, like I say, we have a brand new 350 build coming up. We have a Mopar 360 to freshen. I have uh, various things on the go here. I have a 5.3 for my Sonoma that's taking up too much room in my garage right now. It really needs to go. So the frame's outside. The engine's in a bag over there. Everything's been test fitted. It'll be going together. But again, anything positive or negative, leave me some feedback if you would in the comments and I'd really appreciate it. And again, we're going to be starting a new build, so follow along. Thanks. Have a good day. Bye.